Whether the team is performing clean or unsightly, we'll cover it all here on Washington Football Nightly. I, of course, am your host, Louis T. Thank you for joining me. Let's get to tonight's lead story. So I'm about to do the unthinkable. I'm going to do the Louis T. thing that I like to do quite often, and that's play devil's advocate. And in, the, in a season that has not gone according to plan and, and doesn't seem like it's heading in the right direction, I'm going to do the thing that's unpopular right now and talk about how this team could actually turn things around and make the postseason. What? <laughs> what? I know. It's crazy. Just hear me out. Okay? So, this team right now shows no signs of turning this season around. Well, I shouldn't say no. They show little to no signs of turning this thing around and being a good football team. But as we know, this league is wacky, zany, and crazy. And anything can happen. Again, last year, for instance, and I get it, this is not last year. But, as I just said, hear me out. This... This team last year, at one point, was 2-7. and seven. At that point of the season, who thought Washington would be in a position to run off four straight and be within a game of 500 going into a home game week 15 versus Seattle? Like, that was unfathomable back in, like, week number 10 when we were 2-7 and seven and stunk. Okay? But it happened. Now, again, don't have the same caliber of teams and quarterbacks on the schedule as that team last year had. Don't have the same defensive chops, it would appear, as we had last year. But remember, we started slow defensively last year, and I get it. It's not the same defensive schedule or offensive schedule. It's not the same, you know, offensive uh, firepower or lack thereof that we're facing defensively, which allowed us to feel like this defense was half decent. That said... Let's see what Ron Rivera and Jack Del Rio and this staff is able to do in the second half of the season. Eventually, we'll get healthy. Now, again, will it be in enough time? We'll see, but eventually, we will get Curtis Samuel healthy. I know it doesn't seem like it right now, but eventually, he will be healthy. Eventually, we will get Brandon Sheriff back. Eventually, we will get Logan Thomas back. Eventually, this offense will be back at full capacity so we think Antonio Gibson eventually will get him back and so the offense which hasn't been terrible but hasn't been really good recently may be able to finally show its true colors and maybe this defense which has been taking steps baby steps I may add okay granted baby steps but steps nonetheless in the right direction the last two weeks against the Saints forced a couple of turnovers in that game give the offense some great field position and a chance and this week, again, gave up 500 yards, essentially 499 to be exact, to the Chiefs and Patrick Mahomes. But this was a 13-10 game at halftime that Washington was leading, and they had generated three turnovers in the first half of this game. Okay, the defense, it's taking strides. Now, again, 11-17 on third downs, eight straight third down conversions for the Chiefs in the fourth quarter on uh, one of their final possessions. I get that. Okay, but before that eight straight streak, the Chiefs, weren't killing us on third downs, all right? They weren't killing us on third downs. So they were three of six before eight straight on third down. Excuse me, three of nine. They were three of nine. So the defense is getting better. Again, baby steps, incremental baby steps, but steps in the right direction nonetheless. So Here's what I'm presenting to you. And I know you say, Louis T, you're crazy. You're effing crazy. This whole optimism that you always try to present, this is ludicrous. You're crazy. It's not happening. And you're probably right. But let's just go down this path for shits and giggles, okay? Why not? I mean, what do we have to lose, right? So let's take a look at why I, I, I say, hey, this thing is not over yet. Let's take a look. So I want you to take a look at... The NFC standings. So what you're taking a look at is all 16 teams in the NFC. Now, keep in mind, seven of these teams are going to make the postseason, right? So the AFC conference, much like last year, was really brutal. You know, there was a double-digit win team last year in the Miami Dolphins that did not get in. 
There's 17 games this season, so there's even more time for a team like Washington that's struggling out of the gates and out of the blocks to turn things around and make a run at it. Now, it's still early in the season, you know, contrary to popular belief. There's still 11 of these things left, okay? So there's time to grow and evolve and get better and start to play better football. So let, let's just go through the exercise of futility because that's what it is at, you know, week seven, essentially, of seeing what teams we think are going to be postseason teams in the NFC. So unlike the AFC where it's loaded and there are a bunch of teams that are going to be vying for just seven spots, there's not enough. So, sort of like the, the quarterback, the starting quarterback position in the NFL, there's not enough quality here, right? There's not a surplus. So somebody's going to get in down the stretch or at least have a shot to get in down the stretch with a 9-8, and eight, maybe, you know, 8-9 and nine record, potentially. Not saying that it's going to happen, but potentially that could be the case. So let's go through this real quick. Arizona and the Rams. It's pretty safe to say that those two teams are going to make the postseason. Now, Arizona last year started out really well. They faltered down the stretch. I don't think that's going to happen with this Arizona Cardinals team. It's a different team, different mental makeup. Got some veterans on the team that are going to help them along. I, I think this is a different Arizona Cardinals team. The Rams are going to be there, right? So those two teams, we're going to say they're in. Who wins that division? Don't know, don't care. That's two teams, right? Packers are going to win that division in the a uh, NFC North. They're in. Anybody else in that division, you can't count them in right now. The Vikings are skittish. The Bears, they stink. Uh, they're 3-3, three and three, but I, they've played a schedule, and they've won some games. Their defense is really good, I, like it always is. Their offense, not so much. I don't see them winning a ton of games this season unless their defense dominates. And they've had some dominant moments defensively, uh, but the Bears, I think they're going to falter. Uh, so just the Packers right now, that's three. Dallas in the NFC East, that's it. You know, clearly, that is it. That's four. In the NFC South, it's, it's interesting in that division because you still really don't know. Can Atlanta turn things around and come alive? Um, they could easily be 3-2 and two if they would have beaten us. We'll see. They're coming off of a bye week this week. We'll see how they were able to play. I still think the Falcons stink. So uh, we'll see what happens with them. The Panthers started out hot. All right. Like gangbusters. All right. They came out firing on all cylinders, had a soft schedule. They took advantage of that. Now they've played better competition. They've lost three in a row. They stink. New Orleans Saints, we saw them in person. Now, again, they're going to get a lot of personnel back over, you know, the, the next couple of weeks. Coming off of this bye, they should have about five or six, maybe even seven guys back from injury that are going to help them moving forward. So I don't want to count the Saints out, but just for the sake of this argument, I'm just going to say the Bucks are the only lock in that division. Everybody else could falter and continue to struggle, and the Bucks could pull away, win that division comfortably, and the rest of that division is left to fend for themselves, similar to the NFC East and, and really the NFC North as well. So that's five. OK, so two in the West, one in the North, one in the East, one in the South. So that leaves two vacant wild card spots. One's already spoken for with the loser of the NFC West. That team's going to make the playoffs and more likely than not going to be the first wild card. So the fifth seed. So the sixth and the seventh seed in the NFC is essentially up for grabs. Now, again. Washington is two and four, but the next team in, in the wild card race, and we're going to call it the wild card race. It's too early to really even be using uh, the wild card uh, term yet, but is the three and two New Orleans Saints who we did lose to granted, but, and that means they have the tiebreaker over us, but who knows what the Saints are going to do. They could fall off of a cliff this year and end up being six and 10, uh, 11 for all we know. We don't know what the Saints are going to do. Bottom line is, I'm essentially saying we're literally a game and a half out of being the sixth seed in the NFC playoffs. Okay. Now, a lot of you are saying, Louis T, that doesn't matter. We're not going to win any more games this season. I've heard, I've heard that from a lot of you. We're going to go three and 14. Okay, fine. So since you want to go that route, let's go this route. Okay. And take a look at the remaining schedule. So, this is a schedule that I look at and I say, I'm not scared. Not anymore, at least. Okay, The hard part of this schedule, which I told you when it first came out, was weeks three through weeks eight. Okay, 
And we're pretty much through the brutal part of our schedule. Now, we still got to go to Green Bay, still got to go to Denver. Those are not easy contests by any stretch of the imagination. We're going to lose in week seven against Green Bay on the road. We have a chance now. So let's start with week eight because I want to compare this year's team to last year's team from this standpoint. When we were two in seven and we looked like we were dead. And again, some of the, the... the determination of the players in the locker room stemmed from the fact that the division was trash and we still had a chance to win the division. That's not going to be a crutch that we can lean on this year. These guys are going to have to battle and band together and, and come together for one common goal just for the sake of saying, hey, let's just see what happens. You know, right now it doesn't look like we're going to win the division. You're not going to win the division. And we probably won't qualify for the postseason. But let's, let's just see what happens. Let's just win one game. Then win another game, and let's just see what happens. Let's just see where it goes from there. That's, that's the mindset they got to take, one game at a time. So you lose this weekend to Green Bay. That, that drops you to two and five, okay? But let's say you win week eight at Denver, who has lost three straight, and they've got a quick turnaround on a Thursday night against the uh, Cleveland Browns on the road. They could win that game. The Browns are all kinds of banged up. You know, Neither one of their backs are going to play in that game, Nick Chubb or Kareem Hunt. Baker Mayfield just injured himself further than he already was injured going into last week's game. They could beat the Cleveland Browns and snap that three-game skid. But what if they don't? What if they lose that game too and come into that game riding a four-game skid at three and four? I'm not saying that they look like food, but I'm saying I got my fork in my hand. I got my plate out, and I'm looking for somebody to slap a a, a slab of Bronco on, on on the plate. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying. I'm just saying. So week eight is a very winnable game. Whether they win on Thursday or not, it's a winnable football game. So then you go on your bye week. You're going to get some guys back. I don't know if Ryan Fitzpatrick is one of those guys. Honestly, I don't care at this point. Okay? We're going to get some guys back, though. Brandon Sheriff, Logan Thomas. More likely than not, those guys will be back after the bye week. So help is on the way. If I were the team, I would rest Curtis Samuel up until week 10 against Tampa. I want everybody back, and I want to make a run at this thing. Down the stretch. So then you get Tampa after the bye week. I know that seems like a kamikaze mission, but who knows? We played them tough last year. Their defense stinks. We may have a shot in that game. Who's to say? We'll see. Maybe they have some of their defensive players back by then. They get a little healthier in their secondary, and they're playing much better defensively. They're going to be coming off of a bye as well. So both teams in Week 10 will be coming off of Week 9 bye, so it's not like we're going to have any advantage over Tampa. They're going to be fresh and rested just like us. We'll see what happens in that game. But again, if you beat Denver, you feel good coming into that game, coming off of a bye where you got to win, you're feeling good about yourself. Much like last year, remember, Nobody thought we were going to beat the Pittsburgh Steelers. I didn't think we were going to beat the Steelers. My guy Tones did over at Protect Sports. I didn't, however. And so what you had last year was you had to get a running start. You weren't going to just walk up to the Steelers and punch them in the face. We weren't tall enough. So what we had to do was we had to get a running start to jump up and punch the Steelers in the face. And we knocked them out with that one punch. If you beat Denver, you get a running start. Maybe, just maybe, you're able to jump up and punch the Buccaneers in the face with a running start. Now, you only get the running start if you win. We won two games going into that Steelers game. We beat Cincinnati. We beat Dallas. Had 10 days off, a ton of momentum, and we went to Pittsburgh believing in ourselves. We jumped up, and we punched a bully in the mouth. If we beat Denver, we'll go into that bye week feeling good about ourselves, saying, why not us again? We can do this. We did it last year, and we'll get a running start. Maybe we'll be able to leap up and punch the Buccaneers in the face, and all of a sudden now, you're 4-5, and and look at this stretch of football that's coming up. Now, even if you lose to the Buccaneers, and you drop to 3-6, and still look at this stretch of football that's coming up. You're at Carolina. The Panthers have lost three in a row. They're not good. Sam Darnold stinks. They are not good, are the Panthers. Okay, we're not good. I'm aware of this. Who am I to call anybody else not good? I understand this. This is just for the sake of this discussion. The Panthers are beatable is essentially what I'm trying to say. We're beatable. I get it. The Panthers are beatable as well. Don't think Ron doesn't want that one bad and the players won't want it for Ron badly his first time back at Carolina. Carolina came to our place and got us last year. We owe them one and Ron is going to want that one way worse than he wanted it last year because that one was at FedEx with no fans. 
This is going to be back at Bank of America, scene of the crime. He's going to want to go there and be able to say, got those bitches. This is for firing me. Unjustly, I might add. So that's going to be a big one. Then next game, you're at home on a Monday night for the Seattle Seahawks. Russell Wilson will be back by then. So we won't get a break. We won't get Geno Smith like everybody else did. That's fine. I don't care. The Seahawks are the worst defensive team in football right now. They stink. Even with Russell Wilson in the mix, they stink. They're beatable. Now, are we going to be good enough to beat them? Again, we need a running start. We need a running start. We're not going to beat the Seahawks. We, we almost beat the Seahawks last year with Dwayne Haskins at quarterback. With Dwayne Haskins at quarterback. Let me say that one more time. With Dwayne Haskins at quarterback, we almost beat the Seattle Seahawks. I, I think they're a very winnable game, and that's a very beatable team. So, again, you could win three out of the next four. After the Green Bay loss, you can win three out of the next four. And if you can do that, somehow, some way, you find yourself right where you need to be. Okay? You win three out of four after starting the season off two and five. And now you find yourself at five and six. So, again, this is very doable. This is very doable. Now, you go to the Raiders on the road at Vegas. Again, Raiders, they're a solid ball club. They're not world beaters. They, they're a beatable football team. Very beatable. Now, I'm not looking at the Raiders like food. They should be looking at us like food. But again, they're not Buffalo. Okay, they're not Kansas City. They're not Green Bay. That's a winnable game. Then you get to the, the meat and potatoes of your schedule, the NFC East. I know Dallas is winning all these games. Dallas, I'm, I'm, not, I'm sorry. I'm not afraid of them. I'm not. And you know what family business looks like. I watch them against the Patriots. They make mistakes. They, they give other teams chances to win. We're not New England. That's a well-coached football team. That's not us right now. They're not, they don't beat themselves. They're not disorganized and disheveled. Um, but... The Patriots aren't all that great either. They almost beat Dallas. Dallas is beatable. Okay, I'm not. We're not looking at a a juggernaut of a team in the Dallas Cowboys. They're very beatable. Eagles stink. Giants stink. Okay, we got two. We got three games left between the Eagles twice and the Giants. That's three games that are very winnable, and I think we can split with Dallas. That's just me. I might be living in La La Land. And I'm going to get it in the comment section. You guys are going to tell me how crazy I am. I'm just looking at this slate of games, and I'm saying, why not? Why can't we do what we did last year? This is a fact for those of you who want to go and check. Ron Rivera's teams have proven to be better as the season progresses. Go look at Ron Rivera's record in November, specifically December. Go look at his teams. He's had, and a lot of people are like, well, Ron's only had three winning seasons in 10 years. He's a terrible coach. Cam Newton covered up for all of his deficiencies. I've heard everything you guys have had to say. You can say whatever you like. You can say whatever you like. Yeah. I'm just telling you that even in those years where they went 7, 8, and 1, and 6, 9, and 1, but they still made the postseason or won the division or whatever the case may be, they got there because they got hot late. They played good football when it mattered most. Why can't that be us? We did the same thing last year. We played our best football from no, in, into November, bleeding into December. We played our best football. From mid-November into December, we played our best football last year. Started with a home win against the uh, Bengals. Then a Thanksgiving win over the Cowboys. Then the improbable win in December against the um, Steelers. Then the, the road victory at San Francisco in December. And then we had a letdown at home against Seattle, but we were banged up in that game. No Antonio Gibson, no Cole Holcomb, and we still almost won the game. So all I'm saying is, don't count us out just yet. The NFC is not loaded. There, there, it, there's no guarantee that, you know, there's going to be seven really good teams that are going to box a team like Washington out down the stretch. 
I think we can get to November playing meaningful football, but we've got to take care of business. Week eight is the game I circle on the calendar. We're not beating Green Bay next week. I'm, I, just like we weren't beating Kansas City last week, we're not beating Green Bay this week. And that's okay. Denver is very beatable. I'm circling that game and saying if we want any chance, and even if we lose that game, it's not dead because there's still winnable games on the schedule, but you'd rather be 3-5 and five going into your bye feeling good than 2-6 and six going into your bye feeling lousy knowing that Tampa Bay is waiting for you on the other side and 2-7, and seven, more likely than not, is waiting for you on the other side of that bye. Because even if you get hot, you're not going to win enough games at 2-7. and seven to get to the postseason. Now, if you're three and six after that Tampa game and you get hot, all of a sudden you win three in a row and you look up and you're six and six. You're like, oh shit, here we go. And then we got five straight division games to finish up. Why not? Again, highly unlikely, but not impossible. I'm not saying, I'm just saying. So don't kill me, okay? (laughs) I'm just your man, Louis T., Here to provide a different perspective. It may be far-fetched. And more likely than not, we're a 5-6 win team. But looking at that schedule, very doable. Looking at the NFC Conference, very doable. It's early. We don't know who's who yet. But I feel confident saying five spots are spoken for in the NFC. But I think two are out there and available. Why can't we grab one of them? We're not that far off. Those two spots right now being occupied by teams that are three and two and three and three. We're literally a game and a half out of sixth and a game out of seventh. It's early, a lot of football left. Let's see what happens. Maybe Taylor Heineke turns it around, gets hot. The legend of Heineke comes back and starts to grow again. Who knows? Maybe the offense gets healthy and we start putting up points left and right, get into an offensive rhythm. Maybe this defense wakes the hell up, more importantly. They're starting to show signs of life. We'll see. Anyway, let's get to in other news. So I want to start off with this. You know, I don't really like talking about shit like this because to me, it's inconsequential. And it, it doesn't bother me any. I just look at it and I chalk it up to the youth of America being lost and misguided. And that's, that's the state that we live in right now with these young kids. They don't know any better. They're ignorant and they don't care, frankly. All right. They're dancing everywhere. Look at Juju Smith-Schuster. He cares more about, you know, TikTok and dancing on other teams logo before the game than he does making sure that he doesn't draw attention to himself or his team and give the other team bulletin board material. Why? Because That's how young kids are. They're selfish. They don't care about anybody but themselves. And that's that's, that's an epidemic, but that's the society that we live in, and that's this new generation of kids. They're selfish. They they, Look at me. That's what they care about. That's why they want to be on Snap. That's why they want to be on TikTok. Look at me. Look at what I'm doing. I'm cool. Like this. Share it. Make me famous. Make me popular. So when I see Jackson Mahomes... Dancing on Sean Taylor's 21 on the sidelines, a lot of people got bent out of shape. I wasn't one of them. I just looked at him and I said, that kid's a dick. He doesn't get it. You know, he he doesn't get it. He doesn't understand what the hell he's doing. He's ignorant. And that's not the first ignorant thing he's said or done. So we know this kid, he doesn't have it all. He's one of these spoiled brats that because his brother's famous, he thinks he's famous. No, you haven't done a damn thing to be famous. Your dad was an athlete. Your brother is an athlete. You're just a joke. But you're riding everybody else's coattails. So you get to be in the spotlight because your brother is the man. That's fine. If that's what he wants to do, if that's how he wants to go about his business, riding the coattails of his brother instead of getting your own shit, you know, that's your brother's spotlight. Get your own, your own, you hurt. No, I don't think that's not how these new boys and this new generation is wired. Hey, I got a path to success. My brother's paving it for me. I'm going to just ride that thing on out. That's how the, that's the new reality television and social media era that we live in where you don't have to actually be talented, you know, or, or be able to have a, a specific trait that makes you different and unique. You just got to be able to put yourself out there. And if enough people are attracted to you or you have a 
famous family member that brings attention your way. Hey, there you go. So was I appalled? No. Was I disappointed? Sure. But you know what? He said when it first happened, they told us to stand there. And the first thought I was saying to myself is, they didn't tell your ass. It was roped off. They didn't tell you to stand on the 21. Then I'm looking at pictures. Yeah, they did tell them. Washington did tell them to stand on the damn 21. So we anything that happened, it deserved to happen because they told them to stand on the 21. Where's the psychological sense in that? All the space on the sidelines that they could have been standing, they put a VIP rope around the 21. I'm thinking to preserve it so nobody steps on it. And then they tell people, visiting fans at that, hey, stand here. I mean, but again, it's the Washington football team. It's the same organization that told us three days before they were honoring one of the most beloved figures in the franchise, three days before they were going to do it, hey, we're going to do it. Which I told you why they did it. They did it because of all the negative PR they were getting and nobody was going to show up to the game and they panicked and they said, hey, we got this ace in our back pocket. Let's pull it out. This is the same organization that went to honor London Fletcher and put on the jumbotron London Fletcher. They don't pay, they don't pay attention to the details. They don't pay attention to things that matter. They, they're very, very sloppy. They're very, very dumb in the way that they handle business. And frankly, they're careless. And that to me was a careless act and dumb, frankly, to, to allow people to stand on the 21. You put it there for a reason, not for it to be desecrated, but for it to be there, to be showcased, to be honored. And you let people stand on it? You rope it off so people can stand on it? So when he's dancing on it, what difference does it make? I could see if it was roped off, nobody was supposed to stand there, and he climbed over the rope and then started dancing on TikTok. Then I was like, oh yeah, you went out of your way to be special because you knew that that wasn't supposed to be touched. And instead of you avoiding it, you went and got on it and danced and recorded yourself dancing on it purposefully. He was standing there pretty much the entire game. So... Or pregame, I should say. He was standing there. That's where they were told to stand. So, is it was it dumb? Yeah, it was dumb. He could have danced anywhere but there. But he wasn't. He wasn't thinking about the twenty-one. He was just like, "Oh, look at me! I'm dancing. I'm Jackson Mahomes." Hey, I I honestly don't care. I I I I wish I had more feelings about it, but I don't. So, but a lot of you wanted me to speak on it. That's how I feel about it. He apologized. Do I believe his apology? Much like the Washington football team's, you know, ap apology to us and, oh, we, we've been planning this for months. Do I believe it? No. I don't believe him. I don't believe them. Doesn't matter. What's done is done. It is what it is. I don't get bent out of shape over things like that. Who, I mean, honestly, in the grand scheme of things, what difference does it make? This is the same organization that botched this whole thing. They got Sean Taylor's family posing in front of a sign that says Sean Taylor way and there's eight porta potties in the background of the picture right where the sign is like this is what the organization is putting out there like they're doing something good it's a joke so is Jackson Mahomes he's a joke I don't give people like that the attention that they seek let everybody else do that but you guys wanted me to talk about it there it is I'm more inclined to talk about the roster moves that were made by Washington today. Yeah, they made a couple of roster moves. Um, they moved on from Kelvin Harmon again, okay, um, to create space. Actually, they moved on from two players, and I'll get that information uh, right now. And they signed two players. So... Let's get to that real quick. I know they signed uh, Chris Blewett back, the kicker, um, which <laughs> we already had that discussion, so I'm not going there again. They released Kelvin Harmon and Cole Luke. For you, Kelvin Harmon stands out there. He ain't it. Uh, we cut him after the season. Nobody gave him a sniff. We brought him back. 
they they don't think very highly of Kelvin Harmon. You know that, and, and apparently the league doesn't either. So, um, and Cole Luke, who they just brought on like two weeks ago, they released him as well. You know how it is in the NFL. You know, last to come on, first to go. It's no different than any other job. You know, if we start cutting guys and we start cutting bait a lot of times, if you're the last to come on, you're going to be one of the first to go. Unless we're looking to cut pay, then some of those people with seniority, you're making a ton of money. We can probably fill your position with somebody making a lot less. We'll get rid of you first. But more likely than not, it's always last to come, first to go. And they replaced those two with Chris Blewett, the kicker, um, who's going to be on the practice squad, along with Dejon Harris, who is a linebacker, to give us a little bit more depth at that position. So, uh, again, don't read too much into either one of those signings other than Dustin Hopkins missed another kick. They want a guy on the practice squad just in case. Because to me, if you're going to make a change, then that change needs to be made like during a bye week or something like that. Like there needs to be time. This can't be something you just rush into. Um, honestly, I've already stated how I felt. If you're going to make a change or my thing was you didn't have to make a change. At least give him competition. But remember, Hopkins is on a one year deal. They, they re-signed him in the offseason. One year deal. We'll see where this thing goes. You know, bottom line is. He's 9 of 11 this year, 8 or 9 of 11 um, on field goals. He's missed a couple of extra points, obviously, I'm aware. Uh, but he's been solid, rock solid this season. You know, you hate that he missed a kick uh, at, at a time where the momentum was in the favor of Washington and he killed all the momentum in the game. Yes, totally get that, understand that. But to look on Twitter today when the Jaguars released Josh Lambeau, who, one, is dealing with injuries and has been all season long, but... Two, hasn't made a kick all season long. Is 0 of 3 in field goals and 0 of 2 on extra points. And people are clamoring for this guy. Like, what? This guy hasn't made a kick all season. I don't want to hear about this guy, what he did two years ago when he didn't miss many kicks. That was two years ago. This is a Janet Jackson league. What have you done for me lately? Do, 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 do. Ooh, yeah. What, if what has he done lately? Not a damn thing. The Jaguars were the only team in the NFL through six weeks to have not made a field goal because of that guy. And you want him here? Give me a break. Anyway, that's going to do it for me, your man Louis T, here on uh, tonight's installment of Washington Football Nightly. I thank all of you for joining me. Look forward to chopping it up with you tomorrow night live as we start to turn our attention to the Packers. Um, I will... I uh, have some film breakdown for those of you who um, are eligible. Um, they actually have the film up early this week. The film, they've messed it up. They totally messed up the film. It's not the same. It's horrible. I'll see what I can do. It's, it's not ideal. I can just tell you that. You know, they, they, they really totally botched this thing. And they took a good thing, a really good product, and made it inferior. Uh, but nonetheless, I'll make do with what I have. Uh, and we'll take a look at some of the things that did and, or did not happen on Sunday and, and start to move forward towards the Packers um, in week number seven. But um, And studs and duds will be coming your way soon as well. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Also, in any event, that's going to do it for me, your man, Louis T. I am a Washington fan, etched in burgundy and gold. My Washington spirit will never die. Washington spirit will never fold. Until we meet again, hail to our beloved Washington football team. Um, Tomorrow night, 8.30p, we'll be live for Washington Football Nightly. Look forward to all of your comments, uh, questions, concerns. I know I'm going to get killed in the comment section for what I said today. I'm ready. Bring it on. But I, I'm, I haven't given up. I haven't given up. And looking at the NFC conference as a whole, neither should you. And I know you're saying, what? Louie, you tripping, man. Maybe I am. And I probably am. But we'll see. Anyway, you guys have a great night. I'll see you tomorrow. Here comes the diesel. Here comes the diesel. There's the snap. Hand to Riggins. Good hole. He's got the first down to the 40. He's gone. The 35, the 30, the 20. He's gone. He's gone.